How do you actually work with bottlenecks and split lines and double capacity on a capacity analysis? And what does it mean for our process speeds? Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today we'll be talking about bottlenecks, but specifically also about capacity analysis. Things like duck time, cycle through time, the total runtime that you need to get from start to finish of a process. And how do you calculate the, the numbers there, the, the speeds, and do things add up when they are split out? And how do you redesign? So we've got a nice packed video for you on different ways of thinking and calculating about the process capacity using a chart and also uh, taking into account how and where we have the bottleneck in our system. Now what we have is a process that has a, a whole bunch of steps. They all take their own number of seconds to complete and in the end we get a product. This could be I don't know, making a nice cappuccino at a Starbucks or something like that with a cookie attached and a name and something like that you can imagine happening. You know, you've got your customer order coming in, they need to get down some details, then they also need to prep the stuff for the payment and the bill. And the, then it goes into making the actual cup of coffee. And here what you see is we have two lines. So we've basically got two baristas doing the same thing and they can they can both make you a cappuccino, they both take equally long, they have their own machines and they can work independently. And then again, one person is handing it all out, uh, getting the documentation online and finishing stuff up. Now, this intake goes pretty quickly. Also, here we are splitting up into a bit of preparation and then the actual brewing process that takes the most time after which we really need to sprinkle a, bit of, a little bit of chocolate on it and then get it out to the customer. This, this is also why it had been split. Now let's first check the, the really basic situation of what if I come in and I order one of those cappuccinos and there is no one around, so everyone's ready to serve me my drink. How long will it take me to get my drink? For this, we just take the shortest path that we can. So that is five, uh, 10 and five and five, but 20, 30, 70 seconds, 100 seconds, just to get through the quickest way. But now, how many drinks can this team make per minute, per hour? So, how many customers can they serve? For this, we are more looking at that capacity picture. So this is just a flow through. But now, if we assume, and we'll get back to this because it's quite a big if, but when we divide up into such squares, we're generally talking about something a bit bigger than, uh, than a coffee shop because we assume that all of these processes are independent for now. So this one, because it takes 10 seconds, they can make six orders per minute. And we can do 12 order preps per minute. And here we get into, a, we can only do one and a half making of the cappuccinos per minute. But remember this whole line was doubled. So basically we can make three because this becomes 20 seconds. And then also to do the decoration at the end, Again, you need 20. So what is the slowest part of our process? It seems to be here, but actually it is 40 divided by two. So in the end, we see that we have two equally slow bottlenecks. And that leaves us to know that this process has a capacity of three drinks per minute. Because this has two lines that take 40 seconds at the highest part at their bottleneck. But we also have the 20 seconds here. So 20 seconds is our 
needed time, our tact time for this whole process. But of course, you would not put 10 people, because these are 10 processes all together, into your one coffee shop. Things are combined. And then there is still a reason why I did not put the numbers all together uh, at the beginning. But now we see that if you cannot do all the steps independently, we get a completely different picture. So let's say. that we have got four people working in this coffee shop. Somebody at the till, taking in new orders, two baristas actually making the drinks, and one person serving it out to customers and doing a bit of the decoration. Now we, and they have to be at their processes. So now what we see is that we have 15, 55 and 30 seconds to do each of those processes. But of course, again, we have two of these lines. And we actually come out with a nicely balanced system. So where you had expected that this part takes so long, we also put a second operator in place and we are now very close to the time it takes that final operator to get everything served out. The only thing is that in the beginning we're sort of losing out. Now, when we do a process optimization, so we're gonna work on something in this order and we can you know, seriously slash the time that it takes to do this process step. Now we really want to take a look at bottlenecks. You see, if we can automate this whole entry point, maybe we can get rid of an operator, saving labor cost, but it will not really help us in how many drinks we can make. So any time saving here is of limited use. When we start working here, however, things become much more interesting. So let's just take the bottleneck, which is now the serving operator who decorates the coffee and then hands it out to our customers. And let's assume that we can really seriously improve that decorating option. So we've got a, a small machine or some templates that just sprinkle on that cocoa almost automatically, set up a few systems. Hopefully it's not too expensive, and what we're going to do is we're going to improve this station and it becomes five seconds. So now this is no longer our bottleneck. And also this whole serving to the customer's part is no longer the bottleneck of our process. And this creates some interesting effects in our coffee shop. Because we used to be able to, with the green situation, the more realistic situation, right? The, the black and purple here, that was if each part of the line could operate fully independently. The green is also linked by operators into what can not be done at the same time. We were able to serve two drinks per minute. Now we seriously slashed one of our more problematic parts, basically the biggest part of the bottleneck. And we halved the total time for this serving operator, the serving barista. But we did not, of course, double the throughput of the system. And that is because this may have gone to 15 seconds, so four drinks per, uh, per minute. But this part, the middle part of the system, is still at 27 and a half. So we hardly improved the total process. But we did now shift a bottleneck, and this is why you want to make such overviews when you have a multi-step process, but why also you want to split out the tasks within the picture of an operator. Because what I see happening a lot is that, and it's a lot easier indeed, but it's that the green rectangles 
become the, let's say, the, uh, the detail level of our capacity picture. And we would just get 55-55. But check what your operator is doing. Check if there are separate steps in their total work package. Because if we have the red situation, the new situation, we might be able to move a number of things. For instance, can we do something here? So can we move this part into the work of the first operator? We would then have that they do need to sort of double down a bit, but they need to make that first preparation step for each of the drinks, so we're not dividing this by two anymore. So we've got our 20 seconds here. Twenty seconds for our person taking the orders. Now we've only got 50 seconds left now here in making the coffee, divided by two, that's 25. And here we went down to this 15, so we also keep it at 15. We are now down to the nice 25. Could we go even further? Could we, for instance, move this process also to the operator at the beginning? Well, then it would be 30, 20 and 15. So we're now getting over our current optimum. And yes, I know maybe, uh, especially in a coffee shop, the person taking the orders can work together with the person handing it out and you can move and optimize it even a bit more and sort of make this whole part and that whole part a joint line with two operators. We'll get a little bit under the uh, 25 seconds by that. But the main picture here is that when you draw out your process flow and then you put the cycle times that each part of your process needs on there and into a task level detail. So not per entire operator who is doing a couple of steps, but as one process, but into what are they actually doing in those steps. That will allow you, first of all, to talk about, you know, how long does it take? Or also, how quickly can we actually make things? So in that case, it was 30 seconds, every 30 seconds, so two per minute. But the most valuable part that you will get from this is that now we can talk about the effect of our improvements in a better way. Improving this part of the process only is really usable if we then make that change as well. Otherwise, we're hardly getting any result from it. Now we are already doubling the result we would otherwise get. And we also know that if we want to go to a next step, this is the area we need to look at. Because as soon as we can get that down to five, we can move it either way. Well, we'll still keep it here. If we can shave off time over there, we start to optimize the process further. So when you slash a bottleneck, do not expect immediately your whole system to be so much faster because you'll probably make a second bottleneck. But also when you do an improvement project on a bottleneck and you have this chart ready, you can immediately see what further steps need to be done in your process to maximally benefit from your improvement activities. Because generally, this is relatively cheaper than that. And if that is a good possibility, then you've got a nice combined project. On the other hand, if this is not a realistic option, then it might not even be worth the investment in the first place. So yes, it will save a lot of time at the back of our process, but it will not give us a lot of capacity. So if this is a very cheap upgrade, you might want to do it for things like ergonomics, ease of use, to please the operators, to make a bit of rest in the system. But these are all small things if they do not add to actual improved capacity for your line. So that's what you use a bottleneck capacity analysis for. 
this is also what will lay the foundation for many of the process charts that we use. A value stream map will have a very similar way of looking at throughput and tact and what is the, uh, the time it takes for the, the total process. We'll add some inventory there, but these types of analysis of your processes with cycle times, uh, with how is it all laid out, how many copies of each of the processes do I have, that is a base skill if you want to work on the flow in your process, if you want to work on better throughput, higher capacity of any of the lines, and whenever you are making a capacity improvement to any one of your sub-processes, check that what you are doing there is aimed at the bottleneck, because otherwise you're not going to get any more capacity at all, but also in the savings potential that you take into your books and your planning, know that probably the bottleneck will shift and take that into account for the financial gains because you're not gaining these 15 seconds, you're actually only gaining two and a half seconds in this first example. So that's why this type of charting is one of your first steps in any capacity improvement. And definitely if you're gonna work with theory of constraints, trying to find the bottleneck working on it, subjugating the rest. So completely different story and video. Let me know, by the way, if you want to have some more content on theory of constraints, I would be happy to do it. It's quite powerful stuff for capacity improvement. For now, I hope that you liked this video. Hit the like button if you did. And I wish you the best of luck improving the capacity in your organization. And as always, don't forget to enjoy the continuous improvement journey.